Welcome to Great Minds with Michael Medved. A lot of people look at our history seeing a pattern of happy accidents, but a pattern of happy accidents is still a pattern. It's evidence of intelligent design, not random evolution. A production of the Discovery Institute. On this episode... You write about the impact of both the Big Bang Theory and Einstein's general theory of relativity on the traditional arguments against the existence of God. Right. Does the universe have a beginning or not? It's it's just an absolutely fascinating episode in the history of science that during the last century, scientists were effectively able to answer that question. It's an ancient question. It goes all the way back to the Greeks. Is the universe finite or infinite? Is it eternal and self-existent? Or did it perhaps require a creator beyond itself? The evidence that the universe had a beginning was startling and shocking, and it upset a lot of philosophical sensibilities. That and more on this episode of Great Minds with Michael Medved. Here's Michael. Welcome to this edition of Great Minds with Michael Medved, where my guest is Dr. Stephen Meyer, who has kindly agreed to join us in discussing one of the most substantive, explosive, controversial issues imaginable, scientific evidence, not philosophical, but scientific evidence for the existence of God. That's right. On this show, we don't hesitate to tackle the most controversial subjects, subjects that never go away because they are so important and they are, in fact, eternal. Yet also, because uh, we're candid about it, they're also so very, very divisive. Now, many people would shy away from raising the topic of science and God, and particularly of science for God. But Steve Meyer never has. Steve is a friend, and he directs the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute here in Seattle, which uh, produces this show. And in his best-selling books, Signature in the Cell and Darwin's Doubt, Steve has fearlessly challenged, uh, challenged some of the reigning orthodoxy about science and the origins of life and the origins of animal life and intelligent animal life. Now, as if this wasn't controversial enough, I want to talk about his next book project, which he's working on right now, and which actually was reflected in a award-winning journal essay he wrote in a peer-reviewed journal. That essay was called The Return of the God Hypothesis. The audience can find that essay along with more information about Steve and his work on this show's home on the internet. That's mindswithmedved.com. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe so you can be the first to find out about future episodes and also so that you can donate to make sure that uh, these episodes, these programs continue. Steve, one of the most obvious questions about you're writing an essay called The Return of the God Hypothesis, is it seems to confirm all those terrible things that people have said about you over the years, which is that the so-called intelligent design movement, of which you are a leader, is really just a Trojan horse for people who are trying to allow for a religious comeback. Why would you risk confirming all these dark fears by talking about the return of the God hypothesis. Great question. We're, we're in kind of a double bind because we're also accused of being disingenuous and not willing to address these deeper questions. So when people say intelligent design is religion, we've said, no, it's not religion. It's based on uh, scientific evidence and established method of scientific reasoning. And the evidence of intelligent design in biology gets to you to the conclusion that a designing intelligence of some kind must have played a role in the origin and history of life. But that leads to a second-order question, a more philosophical question, granted, and that is, what is the nature or the identity of that designing intelligence? Who do you think designed life and the universe? And I actually think there's other scientific evidence that helps to answer that question. So the, this isn't a... Um, one of the distinctions that we've made is we're not like uh, many biblical creationists who base their theories on an interpretation of the book of Genesis. We're making an inference to intelligent design based on biological evidence. But I think there's other evidence from physics and cosmology that actually helps answer the question of the likely identity of the designer responsible for life in the universe. And so I am interested finally in what is, what's the truth about these big questions. And so I get asked 
who do you think the designer is? And I actually have an opinion about that. I've developed that in this article that you mentioned. Okay, you also write in the article about the rise and you say fall of some of the traditional arguments for God's existence. And you separate those arguments into cosmological arguments and design arguments. What's the difference? The, the cosmological argument is the, the argument from, for, from the first cause or the need for a first cause to explain the first effect. And there are a couple different forms of cosmological argument, but one of the popular ones in the Middle Ages was known as the Kalam cosmological argument. And it went like this. Whatever begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe must have a cause separate from itself. We call that cause God, said the medieval philosophers. That argument fell into some, not so much disrepute, but just uh, disrepair in the period of the Enlightenment, as many people said, well, uh, we, we'll grant you the first premise that whatever begins to exist must have a cause, but how do we really know the universe had a beginning? And there wasn't really a scientific way to settle that question. There were some philosophical arguments against what were called actual infinites, but there was no decided scientific evidence for a beginning to the universe. And it became more and more the default view during the 19th century and into the early 20th century that the universe was eternal and self-existent. Um, it, it was infinite in time and space. It didn't have a beginning. So that in a sense, matter was the thing from which everything else came, matter and energy. Is that related to what they used to call the steady state theory? Right. The steady state was actually an attempt in the 1940s and 50s to resuscitate that kind of default view coming into the beginning of the century that was challenged by the discovery that the universe did have a beginning, what we now call the Big Bang Theory. And you write about the impact of both the Big Bang Theory and Einstein's general theory of relativity on the traditional arguments uh, against uh, the existence of God. Right. Uh, <clears throat> if that second premise is the key premise, does the universe have a beginning or not, it was a fa it's, it's just an absolutely fascinating uh, episode in the history of science that during the last century, scientists were effectively able to answer that question. It's an ancient question that goes all the way back to the Greeks. Is the universe finite or infinite? Is it eternal and self-existent? Or did it perhaps require a creator beyond itself? Well, the evidence that the universe had a beginning was startling and shocking, and it, it upset a lot of philosophical sensibilities. But it started in the 19-teens with Einstein's um, formulation of the theory of general relativity. His field equations implied that there had been a beginning. And then in the 1920s and 30s, the observational astronomers, in particular Edwin Hubble, uh, found evidence from, of, of an expanding universe that suggested that if the universe was expanding in the forward direction of time, if you went backwards in time, that eventually all the galaxies that were moving away from us now would have been clumping closer and closer together, eventually getting back to a, a, a place where they would have all congealed, marking the beginning of the universe itself. So it was a striking kind of twofold um, dis discovery in theoretical physics and, and then it, separately in astronomy. A scientist came to the, the conclusion that the universe had a beginning for, from two separate lines of evidence. Okay. I know that this is something that my late father tried to explain to me. My, my father, who you knew I well, met your wonderful father. Yes. Yeah. Uh, was a solid-state physicist. Right. And um, the, the, the challenge to people who believe that, well, somehow, if, if the universe all began in a little microscopic and there was a big bang and it's been exploding ever since— and expanding ever since, uh, part of the way that's answered is what's called a multiverse theory. And I, I, it's very difficult to wrap your mind around it. Can you explain what is that? Well, right. There, there's a, there's a, a second wrinkle on the discovery of the, 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 the cosmological discovery. The first wave is that the universe had a definite beginning. The second wave came in cosmological physics or in, in theoretical physics, and that was the discovery that in addition to the universe having a beginning, the universe, was, the universe was finely tuned in its configuration of matter and in the strength and, of, and relationship of the fundamental laws from the beginning. So the universe had a beginning, but it was finely tuned from the beginning, such that we live in a kind of Goldilocks universe where the fundamental forces of uni the universe, the expansion rate of the universe, the speed of light, all of these different parameters are not too strong, not too weak, not too fast, not too slow. Everything is just right to allow for the possibility of life. Well, I know that's the argument about privileged planet, which we've talked about before, about right. planet Earth. So the, how does that apply to the larger universe, which is, of course, infinitely larger than this little one speck? Exactly. The Privileged Planet is a book about the fine-tuning of our Earth and local solar system. 
it turns out that there's a deeper, more fundamental fine tuning that affects the very laws of physics themselves. And the initial configuration of matter at the very, or what physicists call mass energy at the very beginning of the universe. And that's where the multiverse comes in because many physicists starting in about the 50s and 60s with uh, in particular Fred Hoyle, who'd been an advocate of the steady state idea, yeah. a staunch atheist, because of discoveries that he made related, uh, uh, discoveries of fine tuning parameters that he himself made, came to the conclusion that there must be an intelligence behind, behind the universe. He said, in fact, that a common sense interpretation of the evidence suggests a super intellect has monkeyed with physics and chemistry to make life possible. It's a dramatic shift in his worldview as a result of these discoveries. Did he really use the term monkey? Monkey, he did. <laughs> you know, I, I it's like kind that. of a little bar Darwinian. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The monkeys make it into the origins theories, even if it's the physics origins. Even yeah. if it's a super intellect yeah. monkey. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. Isn't that fascinating? It is fascinating. Anyway, the multiverse comes in at that point because people say we can't actually have intelligent design as the explanation for the origin of the universe. <laughs> and they then posit, and there were some physics justifications of this, but they posit not just one universe, the one that is beautifully finely tuned in which we live, but many, many, many other universes. In fact, so many that they would render our universe or, or universe with life-friendly conditions probable somewhere. And then the, po the, the supposition was that we just happen to be the somewhere, the lucky ones who are in the life-friendly universe. Uh, I see. N now, do they concede that we are the only intelligent life in this universe? They don't concede that. No, but they would concede that the 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 fine tuning parameters appear incredibly improbable from our point of view and what they they attempt to explain that improbability away by positing the existence of all these other universes a billion others uh, that are dis causally disconnected to ours but exist somewhere uh, okay that seems like a philosophical argument what i've what I found it difficult to grasp is there is at least a claim that there is some scientific evidence of the existence of other universes. No scientific evidence of the existence of the other universes, but some theoretical models in physics that would render the a belief in them at least plausible. Um, the problem comes in for the multiverse, though, in that for the probabilities in our universe to be affected, there must be some causal connection between the different universes or at least some common cause that produced them all so that we could think of our universe as kind of the winner of a, uh, of, a, of a lottery, a big cosmic lottery. We're the lucky winner of a cosmic lottery. But for that to be true, there has to be some universe generating mechanism that's spitting out lots of other universes so that there's some connection, at least a common cause. Is, is the theory that the other universes are uh, governed by the same laws of physics? Oh, no, they would have uh, maybe other laws of physics and other fine-tuning parameters. That's the whole idea. Oh, then okay. then the, the unique set that we have would be one of uh, a great ensemble of possibilities. But the but you're saying there's no scientific evidence. We haven't gotten some radio no, transmission. No, 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 no nothing no. like that. In fact, the very concept of a universe is, you know, <laughs> the, the, the net total of all that is. So it's a little bit contradictory at that level philosophically. But here's the rub. The... the the, the, the models of theoretical physics that have been proposed to explain where these other universes would come from, so-called universe-generating mechanisms, have invariably themselves required prior fine-tuning <laughs> to explain how you would even get these other so universes. So you need to come back to mind. You, you have Fine-tuning is a product of mind. And that brings us to the other explanation, the other argument, the argument by design. Exactly. But now notice something. Whereas the, the argument for design that I've made in biology involves the origin of events, the origin of life and animal form that arise, arises along the cosmic timeline well after the beginning of the universe, such that it's at least logically possible that it might be produced by an intelligent agent within the cosmos someplace after the beginning. The evidence from fine-tuning suggests a transcendent form of intelligence because it's prior to the existence and even possible existence of any entity within the cosmos that could be alive. In other words, no intelligent agent can be the product of the very laws of physics that apply to it and that make its life possible. Hmm. So this evidence of design, I think, points to a transcendent source, just as the Big Bang itself points to the need for a transcendent cause of the universe. So whereas the argument from design and biology leaves open the question of the, of the nature and identity of the designing intelligence, it might be imminent within the cosmos or a transcendent designer, the evidence from physics and cosmology points in a decidedly transcendent direction such that 
when you take these all these classes of evidence together, and this is the argument that I make in the paper, um, that the best explanation is theistic design, not a space alien, not a deistic creator who creates at the beginning and then, and then never has anything more to do with the creation because we have evidence of design down the timeline in biology. So not a deistic creator, not a space alien, not a pantheistic notion of God because that notion of God is a God that has no mind, no conscious agency. That's a, an impersonal connection or energy force. Only theism that posits a God who creates at the beginning but then acts after the beginning can explain the whole ensemble of the evidence. When you were talking about down the timeline, evidence of a participation in God after this initial Big Bang, and because we're talking now about the return of the God hypothesis, right? are you talking about the Cambrian explosion? Cambrian explosion, origin of life, may, may, maybe other discrete events in the history of life where we see a massive infusion of biological or genetic information in order to account for for the patterns we see in the fossil record. Okay, your colleague Michael Denton has taken this idea of fine-tuning, and I should explain that when you talk about the fine-tuning for people who haven't read about this, it's really extraordinary. I mean, all the things that allow us to be sitting here and having this conversation, aside from these complicated machines that human beings have invented, require so many particulars and unlikely particulars of temperature and the way that the uh, atmosphere is composed and the way that the gravity is implied, the, the size the of the The balance between the fundamental forces of gravitation and the strong and weak nuclear force, the expansion rate of the universe, and the, the fine-tuning is to an exquisite degree. Um, there's one fine-tuning parameter that uh, is hyper-exponentially fine-tuned. It's the, it's the original configuration. Uh, it's the... It's, they call it the, the fine-tuning of the entropy. It has to do with the original arrangement of the ma mass energy at the beginning of the universe. It's hyper-exponentially hyper fine-tuned, which means it's fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123. We can't even get our mind around a number that big. It's an extremely Wait, uh, tiny uh, uh, tolerance. Uh, uh, that's bigger than the national debt. You're bigger I mean, than the national debt, uh, exactly. Uh, uh, a 10? 10 to the 10th, and then raising that number to the 123rd power. There are more zeros in that number than there are elementary particles in the entire universe. And it's one part in that enormous number. This way or that way, and life would not be possible. I, I'm just trying to absorb that. I, I hope everybody out there is as well. Because Okay, so Michael Denton right, says that right. you apply this argument of fine-tuning not just to the Big Bang, but to other aspects of planet, existence. Planet Earth, the, the, the distance of the Earth from the sun, the properties of water. He's just come out with a fascinating new book on the, the amazing multiple properties of water that make life possible. Um, so there, there are many fine-tuning parameters. Jay Richards and Guillermo Gonzalez, and you've interviewed Jay, uh, have, have a, developed a really interesting fine-tuning hypothesis just about the need for the, the different parameters that are necessary to make life on Earth possible, and that the, curiously, those same parameters make it possible for us to discover the, the basic structure of the universe. Okay, if you discover, and I, I've, I've interviewed Dr. Gonzalez on, yeah. the, on the radio show, right. uh, if you do discover some intelligent life on some other planet at uh, some point in the future, does that blow this fine-tuning argument out of the water? No, I don't think so. Um, th there would be different. There are different fine-tuning arguments, but the fundamental fine-tuning is the fine-tuning of the basic laws and constants of physics, the the strength of those fundamental forces, and they apply throughout the whole universe. And the 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 thing about them is that they're necessary conditions of there being life at all anywhere in the universe. So um, they make pot. They make it, in fact, possible to consider that there might be life in other places. But um, the uh, the the, there, there are other considerations that may have made some astronomers skeptical about that. In fact, two uni local University of Washington uh, uh, astronomers, uh, Peter Ward and colleague, I'm dropping his name right now, but they wrote, wrote a book called, uh, uh, oh, Don Brownlee uh, wrote a book called Rare Earth. And whereas um, there are lots and lots of possible planets and galaxies out there, the, the, the number of factors that have to be just right to make life possible actually render all those other planets small in comparison to the, the number of things you need to get right. So they're actually skeptical that there would be a lot of life-friendly planets. As Dorothy said, there's no place like home. No place like home. Yeah. yeah. Um, you had an interesting encounter with a, um, an atheist, prominent atheist cosmologist named Lawrence Krauss. Right. Tell us about that. Well, it was a debate at the University of Toronto 
And I came into the debate hoping to discuss this issue of the cosmological origins. And he uh, started the debate with a fair amount of personal invective. <laughs> and we ended up only debating my ideas about intelligent design and biology. And it was somewhat, uh, it wasn't my best performance. I got a migraine in the middle of the, uh, my opening statement. Um, and uh, I couldn't see my slides anymore, which was a little difficult. But um, we were, we, it was, it came out kind of well because uh, at the end we, we got some good exchanges. And then Richard Dawkins weighed in, and I'd never been able to lure him into a, a direct exchange. Dawkins defended Krauss. Uh, who claimed that uh, I had misrepresented the Darwinian mechanism by by claiming that there was an element of randomness in it. And uh, many evolutionary biologists ended up attacking Krauss, saying that he was misrepresenting uh, the Darwinian mechanism. Dawkins weighed in to say, well, this Meyer, he doesn't understand that Darwinism uh, doesn't is a, is a non-random process or that natural selection is a non-random process. It's true that natural selection is non-random, but the random mutations it acts on are, are completely random. And it's for that very reason that they can't explain the origin of new information. If you've got a section of functioning digital code and you start introducing ran random changes to that code, you're going to degrade that information long before you get a new program or operating system. And the same problem applies in biology and in the origin of the genetic information we need to make new forms of life. So I got to make that argument in print. My response went viral. And so we kept the debate going in print and it worked out pretty well. Okay, that's why we need the return of the God hypothesis. Is that going to be the title of the book? Don't know yet. I'm you know, still conceiving of it, but it's uh, I'm building on these articles I've written with some new stuff that I'm doing in cosmology. Well, Steve, thank you for your contributions and thank you for being with us for these amazing and mind-blowing, really to use a 60s term, uh, conversations that we've been able to have. And if you want more information about Steve's work, uh, and about forthcoming programs of Great Minds with Michael Medved, go to our internet home, which is mindswithmedved.com. You can get information about Steve's work. You can sign up. You can also subscribe on iTunes as well uh, for mindswithmedved.com. And, um, and, and by the way, you're very much encouraged to donate to support this programming. Stay tuned and find out about other uh, offerings from this series, Great Minds with Michael Medved. Thanks for listening to Great Minds with Michael Medved, available at mindswithmedved.com. Great Minds with Michael Medved is produced by Jeremy Steiner and Greg Tomlin and is copyrighted by Discovery Institute 2018. Welcome to this edition of Great Minds with Michael Medved, which is very different from the daily radio show I do that's broadcast across the country. Because on that radio show, the whole idea is to focus on breaking news about what's happening right now that's important. And sometimes that news changes minute by minute, hour by hour, and you have to follow along with a flow of events. But on Great Minds with Michael Medved, thanks to our great friends and sponsors at Discovery Institute, we get the opportunity to spend some time discussing perennial, timeless, permanent, unchanging issues that go to the very core of our shared values and worldviews. Now, to do that with every show, I'm proud to introduce you to a particularly deep and original thinker, a great mind to help us explore great ideas. And my guest tonight is Stephen Meyer. Dr. Meyer is not only a good friend for many years now, he is also a Cambridge University trained philosopher of science. He's the director of Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture and the author of Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligence Design and the New York Times bestseller, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. Probably the best way to begin talking about the origins of life is to define life. What is life, Professor? That has turned out to be a notoriously difficult question by itself to answer. But uh, increasingly, biologists have a kind of uh, working definition that involves uh, a system of 
different components and molecules that exercise or exhibit some kind of purposive behavior. It's one of the first things we notice about living organisms is they seem to have, they have uh, a job to do. Whether it's the potato bugs or the ants or the little insects you notice as a kid, they're, they're exhibiting purposive behavior, they're systems, and they have some kind of a boundary with the environment that allows them to exchange materials across a boundary they process information and they process energy. So those, those kinds of ideas uh, get uh, raised when you talk about the, the definition of life. One of the most um, important <clears throat> aspects of that, we begin to think also about the origin of life, is that as there's a connection between our understanding of the nature of life and our understanding of the, the, the origin of life. When scientists thought that life was very simple, that it could be explained as the result of uh, a few chemical interactions making, in the 19th century, they, they thought a it was formed from a substance called protoplasm. And they, and they thought the protoplasm was made from a few simple chemical uh, substances. Then it was pretty easy to conceive how life might have originated. A few chemical reactions, and you got the protoplasmic substance that constitutes life. But once they were able to peer inside the cell and realize the, how complex the metabolic processes were, the complex interactive chemistry that was going on, and then later the discovery of things like DNA and RNA and proteins, which were information-carrying molecules, uh, the, the, the difficulty of explaining where life came from became very much more acute. Well, again, this is difficult right now. I mean, people are hearing us and uh, they're saying, isn't there a simpler way that a normal person could look at something and determine, is this life or is it inanimate matter? Pretty much everyone can tell whether something's alive or not. But what, what do they look for? Um, I th there, there's a wonderful new book by uh, Scott Turner, a biologist at uh, NYU, um, and he argues that what people see when they, when they see life is they see systems of obviously molecules and physical things that are, have a coherent structure, a coherent form that exhibits some kind of purposive behavior. But you say purpose of behavior, uh, inanimate matter doesn't exhibit behavior at all, does it? It exactly. has properties. It has properties, it, right. Right. Yeah. And so, again, our, uh, when, and when you say purposive, uh, that doesn't necessarily imply consciousness because not all life is conscious, is it? Well, um, Turner argues that there's some kind of cognition even at the very lowest levels of life. But um, there's also this strange mystery associated with instinctive behavior, and that is that... Um, Animals, sometimes can, I mean, animals, plants, insects, uh, various creatures, even one-celled organisms, uh, can accomplish some sort of complex tasks. But as we've studied them, biologists have studied them, we've also realized that, that their range of problem-solving ability usually uh, ends at the behaviors for which they have this kind of pre-programmed instinctive capacity. So you have uh, certain insects that have an ability to um, uh, lay eggs. They form very... Um, interesting, intricate structures where the eggs are formed. And the, there's one that my colleague Ann Gager has been telling me about that has a, forms a kind of a mud ball. And the little insect lays eggs. Uh, and then at a certain time, very precisely programmed, it is able to perform a series of complex behaviors at just as the rains come, soften the egg ball, and they can get their way out. The, the, the entomologists who study these, little, they were beetles, discovered that um, if he provided a way out, that was much simpler, the insect was unable to do a, a simpler task. In other words, they couldn't problem solve, even very simply, which suggested that the, the, the pre-programmed um, instinct, or that the, the instinct was pre-programmed, and that the capacity to do that exceeded the capacity of the cognitive capability of the, of, the, of the little beetle itself. The little beetle brain could do what it was programmed to do, but nothing else. I know we're going to be talking in another uh, opportunity a, a little bit about the origins of the universe. But we now know scientists have uh, a consensus that there was such a thing as a Big Bang, that there was a beginning to the universe as we know it. We don't believe that life came into existence at the moment of the Big Bang. Exactly. The accepted date for the origin of life is about 3.85 billion years ago. The accepted date for the origin of the universe is about 10 billion years before that. So uh, the origin of life is a big question because it wasn't always here. And it, when, we, when we see just how complex living, even the simplest living cell is, um, something quite extraordinary must have happened to explain its origin. Okay, so what, it, it wasn't comparable to the Big Bang. By the way, do we think that the, the earliest life forms 
are still with us? Uh, quite possibly some of them. There's uh, something called stromatolite. And they're one-celled kind of blue-green algae, and they form mats. And we have them today, and we have fossils of them from 3.85 billion years ago. So, wow. So some of the earliest one-celled organisms are probably still with us. Okay, so the question of life's origins really does not connect directly with the always controversial theory of evolution. Right. Well, in a sense, there's two branches of evolutionary theory. What well, Biological evolution is the branch of evolutionary theory that attempts to explain the origin of the first life, or, or the origin of complex forms of life from simpler forms of life going back to the first life. Uh, chemical evolutionary theory attempts to explain the origin of the very first life from simpler non-living chemicals. So Darwin addressed the, the first question, how do we get from simple life to all the complex forms of life we see today? And chemical evolutionary theorists who roughly began formulating sophisticated theories in about the 1930s have attempted to explain that other more fundamental question, which is where did the first life come from, from simpler non-living chemicals. And what did Darwin say about that? Uh, well, he, he speculated in a, in a letter that um, to a friend named Joseph Hooker that perhaps we could conceive of a warm little pond in which there were all kinds of uh, phosphorus, uh, phosphates and chemicals and protein molecules. Um, but then in another place, he said of his own speculation that we'd be sooner to ask about the origin of matter itself. It simply exceeded our our scientific capacity in the 19th century to even speculate about where life first came from. So I remember when I was in a biology class in, um, in junior high school back in the Pleistocene era, um, <laughs> that uh, they used to tell us about the primordial soup. Right. Uh, they don't talk about primordial soup anymore, do they? It's still in all the textbooks, but that's the that's the theory where that's the chemical evolutionary theory that life arose in some sort of favorable aqueous environment where the molecules interacted in just the right way to form. The initial idea was that they formed amino acids. Um, well, in Fantasia, they have a, there's a <laughs> lightning bolt. Exactly, the, the, the yeah. spark discharge chamber of Stanley Miller was sort of simulating that. But that 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 whole Stanley Miller stuff ended up being a fraud. Right? Well, not so much a fraud; it's just not relevant anymore because he presupposed atmospheric conditions that we know weren't present on the early Earth. So he was attempting to simulate how the first amino acids might have formed under plausible prebiotic conditions, but we now know the conditions weren't plausible. And the, the atmosphere at the time would have a quenching effect on the formation of amino acids. And so that's problem one. The deeper problem is that amino acids do not a protein make. And proteins are the complicated molecules and machines that do all the important jobs in cells. To build them, you've got to get amino acids arranged in very precise ways, like letters in the alphabet spelling words and sentences. And so even if you got amino acids, the deeper sequencing problem was never really addressed by Miller's experiment, and it remains a mystery today. Uh, where did the information come from to build those complex molecules that perform all the important jobs in cells? Well, th this is fascinating to me because one of our previous um, shows, we talked uh, with your colleague Jay Richards about robotics and how advanced we are in designing these very complex, thinking, acting, seemingly living robots. Uh, how come we can't create cute little unicellular organisms. I mean, if we can create these big, moving, almost thinking, functioning, human-like machines, why, why can't we create something alive? Life is more complicated than our most uh, advanced uh, computer, computerized technology, although it contains elements that we recognize from our own advanced uh, use of digital information processing systems and, and, and the like. Are we closer to being able to create life out of dead matter? Not really. Uh, we understand more about the necessary conditions of making life, but we haven't uh, come close to understanding what the complete set of sufficient conditions would be. Um, when, when we have an interesting thing that goes on here in the Pacific Northwest where we, we use, we've got great companies, Microsoft, Boeing. Microsoft creates information and sells it. We know that information is a real thing. Um, Boeing uses information to direct, to direct the construction of mechanical systems like airplane wings. So there's a technology called computer-assisted design and manufacturing. Um, engineer will sit at a console, will write some code, the code will go down a wire, it'll be translated into a machine code that can direct the construction of a mechanical system like an airplane wing. The code may put the rivets on the airplane wing in just the right place. We now know that a system very much like that lies at the heart of all of, li of every living organism. How do we know that? Well, it starts back with Watson Crick, 1953. 
they elucidate the structure of the DNA molecule. It's a fascinating story. I tell the story of the discovery itself in, in Signature in the Cell. It's just a great breakthrough in the history of science. And, and by the way, the book is a breakthrough in the thinking of anyone who chooses to read it and encounter it. It's, it's one of the more important books of the recent decades, but go uh, ahead. Well, thank you. In, in any case, they, it's, a, it's a, a great story of scientific competition, different groups trying to figure out the ultimate mystery of where is the information that is responsible for the transmission of hereditary traits. And they d elucidate the structure of the DNA molecule. That's 1953. Four years later, Francis Crick, who was a code breaker in World War II, that's his job. He doesn't have a PhD in biology. He's a grad student in physics who's working with his young 23-year-old um, uh, chemistry PhD from the United States, James Watson. Crick, on his own, realizes that the, the, the uh, subunits of the DNA molecule that are called nucleotide bases, they run on the interior of the double helix. He realizes that they're functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or the, the zeros and ones that we'd use in software today, which is to say it's the, the, these subunits called nucleotides, are, they, they perform a function biologically not in virtue of their atomic weight or their, uh, their, their shape or their structure, but in virtue of their arrangement in accord with an independent code, which is later discovered. And it takes molecular biologists about seven or eight years to elucidate what they call the gene expression system, how the information in DNA directs the construction of these crucially important protein molecules, very similar to the CAD-CAM systems that engineers use today. We write code, we use the code to build a mechanical system. That's what's going on inside cells, says, says Crick. Turns out he's right. And this is a major breakthrough, and, uh, and it's a completely revolutionized our understanding of biology because we now know at the foundation of life is information in a digitally encoded form or an alphabetic form, or some, some scientists have talked about a typographic form of information. But there, so this is a stop press moment in the history of biology. No one had any inkling that what was running the show was literally code, was, was digital code. And so our local heroes here in, in Seattle, Redmond, uh, Bill Gates, uh, Leor Hood, said DNA contains digital code, says Hood. Gates says it's like a software program, only much more complex than any we've ever created. So that's the big mystery. If you want to explain the origin of life, you've got to explain the origin of the information that makes life possible. So if we get good enough at writing code? Well, it turns out that uh, there are layers upon layers of complexity with living systems. And this is where it gets really... We know that the information in DNA is necessary to build proteins. But having proteins alone even with all the other components, is not sufficient to produce a cell. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of times people from the popular press get the idea that uh, we've simulated or we've, we've, built, we've built artificial life or something. We're, we're not even close on that. Okay. You talk about this enormous complexity, and, and, and reading Signature in the Cell, it's, it is mind-boggling. Is there any comparable complexity anywhere in inanimate matter? In, in rocks uh, or, or liquids or anything else? Only in things that human beings have designed, and the, most, the closest analog is our own high-tech digital information processing systems. In other words, how would you compare, uh, say, a, a very nice piece of rock, say a gold nugget, we all like gold nuggets, the complexity in that substance as opposed to this, uh, these a 3.8 billion year old organisms you're talking about. Yeah, maybe if I could slightly alter your question, it will provide me an opportunity with a slightly more illuminating answer because one of, the, one of the things we we chemists recognize is the repetitive structure of crystals. And that's a kind of order that we find typically in inanimate matter. You know, uh, sodium chloride, salt, it has the beautiful uh, repetitive s uh, structure that is the result of the Na and the Ca, the, the or Na and the Cl, combining you have the positive charge and the minus charge, and so you get a nice repetitive structure. Um, in life, there is order, but it's a different kind of order. It's not re simple repetitive order. It's what what we sometimes call sequence specificity or complex or, or sequence uh, uh, or, or, or a specified complexity. It's the kind of order we find in language. Or in, or in computer code, where there's a sequence, where, where the sequential arrangement of the subunits or characters is um, crucially important to the function that the whole system plays. And so there's a, it's a kind of order, but it's not repetitive order. 
it's the kind of order we find in information. And this is the essence of what is meant by intelligent design, is the idea um, that this is code. It had to have been written. It had to have been created by some with some kind of purpose to it. The, one of the hallmarks of science is prediction, being able to predict things based upon your scientific conclusions. What predictions would the theory of intelligent design lead to? Well, it's led to a number of predictions, but even prior to that, and more importantly, it's provided the first uh, plausible explanation for the origin of the information in DNA that's necessary to build the first life. Um, Darwin used a different method of scientific reasoning. He pioneered a method of historical science that allowed us to reconstruct the causes of events in the remote past. So that historical scientific reasoning is more concerned with explanation after the fact than it is with prediction before it. And uh, so this was a method that Darwin used, and he had a, a, an important criterion for determining when um, a, a posited explanation was best, and that is that the, the, po the, the explanation posited must, must offer a cause which is known to produce the effect in question. And when I came across this crucial methodology that Darwin developed, I ended up asking myself a question, and that is, what is the cause that we know of that produces digital code, digital information? In other words, from our uniform and repeated experience, the basis of all scientific reasoning, especially about the past, what do we know about what, what it is that produces information? And the answer is that it, it, a mi only minds do that. And in my book, I look at all the other attempted materialistic explanations, those based on chance, those based on natural laws, those based on a combination of the two, and all of them have come up against this impasse. They can't explain the origin of information, but there is a cause of which we know that does that, and that cause is mind. It's, in, it's intelligence. And so the basis of the inference to design is actually our, our knowledge, our uniform and repeated experience of cause and effect in the world around us. We know that minds generate code and information. And so when we find it at the, at the very basis of life, we argue, I argue, that we have come across a very powerful indicator of the activity of a designing intelligence in the history of life or in the origin of the first life. It also happens that there are predictions that follow from intelligent design. For example, we were some of the first people to predict that the the so-called junk DNA would turn out not to be junk, but importantly functional. And in the back of Signature in the Cell, I list 10 such predictions, and many more have been generated. But the most important thing that the theory of intelligent design does is provide the first adequate causal explanation of the origin of the information necessary to build life in the first place. And all fascinating and all enormously important. Thank you for being here today, Steve. The origin of life is one of those great mysteries, and that's been the whole theme of what we're talking about. And you can find more light on this subject uh, from most scientists and scholars uh, and putting their work in perspective uh, by taking a look at some of the information that Steve has put forward in his important book, Signature in the Cell. Uh, that Information about that book and information about these broadcasts is all available at our website, our internet home, which is minds for Med, mindswithmedved.com. Uh, you should check out mindswithmedved.com. And an important thing you can do while you're there is to donate to help support this kind of great, important programming. Uh, it doesn't happen by accident. It requires intelligent design <laughs> and uh, donations. Listeners can also subscribe via iTunes as well. Thank you for doing so in advance, and thank you to all of our friends at Discovery Institute for producing this show. <laughs>